And you are live, Dr. Taylor. Yay, all right. Um, welcome. It is the beginning of fall 2021, and this is the very first exam one review done with the LLC. So again, I'd like to thank the LLC folks uh, because that way the amount of technical stuff that I have to do is really low, which is awesome. Um, so very, very grateful to the living learning community for putting this together. Um, so they took a whole bunch of different questions uh, and I have kind of organized them uh, because the beautiful thing with everyone submitting questions is, is that I think you guys managed to ask about just about everything. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and start with some of the procedural things about your exam because I think that'll help just with what's going on, uh, some of the general basics before we move into content. So we will definitely talk about content. Don't worry, uh, but since it's a very, very first exam, uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time just to talk about some of the formatting things because th and those questions did come in. So I actually pulled a little bit from your syllabus. I know it's such a cliche thing to say, oh, it's on the syllabus. Um, but some people were asking even things like, hey, what's going to be on the exam, which is valid. It's always actually a good question to ask, especially as we continue on in the semester. And some topics will be cumulative and some topics you won't see again until the final, which the final is cumulative. Uh, but exam one, it just says chapters two and three. The other thing that I know you probably already know, we have five midterms. Having five midterm exams is something that we've only now done since last year. So if you have older students that you're talking to, or if you have perhaps acquired previous exams from fall of 2019 or older, the exam materials in a different order because we used to do four exams. And when you do four exams, there's more material on each exam. Um, so this first exam covers chapters two and three and significant figures. Uh, and the other thing with what all is in there, and we'll talk more about the topics um, after some more general things, but uh, since we're now in the fourth edition of the textbook, uh, chapter three got shorter <laughs> in the fourth edition and some topics also moved to chapter four. So it's one of those things that as the years progress, exactly what material is on exam one changes a little bit because both of the number of exams we have in a semester, also because of what chapter three actually means this particular semester. Um, the other thing that came up a lot was um, different ideas of what exactly is gonna happen. So I'm on, this is from page eight of your syllabus. And what's happening here is there's a set that says, um, more specifically, exam and final exam details. So what's going on is uh, the midterms are 90 minutes in length. So you will have 90 minutes. Um, you will have a variety of different question types. I'm going to show you where you can actually see those in just a minute. Uh, we're going to show those questions one at a time on the screen, and it's going to be in the 701 section. This is going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, so 10 a.m. Uh, we are actually, we should all be in the same time zone. Uh, that's a nice change from last time. So everybody's in the same time zone. So uh, there's an exam window that when the exam opens, so you need to get your exam started no later than 10.30, uh, which means you need to sit down before 10. And that way, if you figure out that your laptop charger is in your car, uh, you have time to go get it. If you figure out that your calculator is in your other backpack, you have time to go grab that. Uh, so sit down nice and early to get started because um, that exam window is small, is really, really small. This is an online exam, so you need to have a laptop or a desktop computer. Uh, there is, There are options for that within the university to help you out. Uh, so here in the 701 section, uh, so you guys have some sort of either 001 through 008, but you also have a 701 section. Uh, and in the 701 section, there's actually a link that says need to borrow a laptop from UTD. Uh, so there is a laptop borrowing program, which is through the uh, from OIT. So that does exist. If you need it, that link is there for you. What else do I have in here? Uh, you need a calculator. Uh, we'll we won't see your calculator. Uh, so if that's a graphing calculator, fine. If that's not a graphing calculator and it's a scientific calculator, great. Uh, by now you've seen the kind of calculations that you need to do. So by now you've seen that we are going to use things like Avogadro's number that has that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. 
Uh, and so you need a way to deal with that. So that's what that notion of a scientific calculator means. It's got to be able to handle those exponents. Um, later in the semester, you'll also need something that handles logarithms. Uh, exams will be open book and open notes. I've seen a lot of questions about what you need to have memorized. Uh, so I'm going to have some suggestions because honestly, I think there are some things that are easier if you know them off the top of your head. But technically, you don't have to memorize anything because the whole thing is open book, open note. That being said, don't forget, it's timed. So you only have 90 minutes. So that's the reason why there's going to be times where it's like, yeah, that's going to be easier if you know it off the top of your head because you don't necessarily have time to go look up every single thing. Uh, so there's, there's that interesting pro and con. Then there's this wording in bolds. Uh, so you guys have likely already seen this in, in your lecture uh, courses, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, the bottom line about this is, is that we want you to use your brain. So I understand that it's an online exam. I understand that it's not proctored. Uh, realize that you need to use your own brain. Uh, if you are uploading questions to Chegg to get answers back, we'll find out. We already have a plan to do that. Uh, so just just FYI, uh, you need to use your brain, and that's really the bottom line of that paragraph. So some things about kinds of questions on a happier note. So uh, I sent out this announcement Friday afternoon, so it's relatively new, but in the same 701 section, so that's where I am, 701, there is a folder called exams. And... There's something that says what an online exam might look like. Hey, hey, it's like we anticipated you might want to know what this might look like. Um, and if I go into student preview mode, uh, so as an instructor, I usually have more options for things. Um, but if I go into student preview mode, this will actually look just like it would if you did it. Uh, and it's going to have some more instructions when you click on it. So this mostly has some general warnings. Uh, you also only have one shot at this. Uh, so I don't necessarily recommend that you do it right, right now because uh, you've got a 90 minute timer on it and I'm gonna talk until about 6 p.m. Uh, but whenever you're ready, go ahead and take a look. Um, this is gonna show you some things. Uh, so we are gonna have potentially useful information for you. So there were questions about what constants am I supposed to use and what are those values supposed to be? because I know sometimes we use one value in lecture, there's a different value in Alex, which one am I supposed to use? For anything that we are using, this is what we are gonna use. So at the very beginning, the top of the exam, and since these questions go one at a time, it'll be at the top of every single question, we are gonna give you the constants that we are using. So they will be there for you. Uh, you are also welcome to have them on another scratch piece of paper if that's easier for you, but they will be there. The other thing I like to mention when you see this potentially useful information is uh, as instructors, we just add stuff to this. So for example, you might not need the mass of an electron or the mass of a proton or the mass of a neutron or the charge on an electron. You might not need any of this, uh, but it's there because maybe back in like 2008, we asked a question that needed it. Uh, and so there it is and we've never taken it off. Uh, same thing goes for any of these imperial to metric conversions. There are things that we put on there at some point and we've just never taken them off. Um, so the potentially useful information is not a checklist. Uh, it's That's why it says potentially useful information. You might need it, you might not. Uh, and again, we are a little bit lazy and once we put a conversion on there, we just don't take it off. It's also gonna have a periodic table. This is the periodic table from your textbook, uh, by the way. Uh, so again, if you need any sort of atomic mass, we're gonna have this periodic table on there for you. And these are the values we are going to use. So we are gonna use the periodic table out of your textbook. We're also gonna give you the periodic table out of your textbook. It'll be there on your exam. Uh, and those are the values we're going to use. 
So the other thing you should be able to see is, is that the timer is pretty present. Um, and I think I can hide the question completion status. Uh -huh, look at that, I can. Um, so there's only six questions in my little fake, hey, what does this thing look like? Uh, and then this is a select all that apply. I'm just going to select the first two. I'm not even going to read this question. Uh, and I'm going to use the arrows down here at the bottom to go on to the next one. Uh, and then what you can see is the, my question completion status updates as I go around. Um, so as you take the exam, this will change. This one involves a drop down menu. Um, so. Uh, but it shows a couple different versions of questions that we can potentially ask. Um, so I don't believe I got everything we could possibly ask. I think there's still one more question type or two more question types that didn't make it on here, uh, but at least I got a matching one in there. I did, I did manage to add a matching one. Um, and it does have calculations and I can skip a question if I want to and go back to it. So here's one where you actually have to enter a number. And so here are the instructions for how to enter numbers. This will also give you practice with how to enter calculations. What does that look like? Um, so there's also some practice ones for just entering that. Um, so that's question four. I can go ahead and go back and go backwards to question three. Uh, one thing I do want you to note, so it is showing them one at a time, uh, which means that the questions each have to load one at a time. I know some people like to skip around a lot, uh, and your how well skipping around the exam works for you is going to be somewhat dependent on your internet speed. That is a sad thing, but that is a true statement. Um, you can ask the biochem class I had in the spring of 2020 because they had questions one at a time and they often wanted to jump around a lot and then they lost time due to loading. Um, so again, you are welcome to skip things and go back to them. Just be aware that the more you skip around, those questions do have to load and that will take some of that time. That is, by the way, why your exam is 90 minutes. They used to be 80. Uh, so we actually added 10 minutes for the online format. So before you say, hey, are you going to add time to our exam to deal with loading? <laughs> we already did. Um, so you, you already have more minutes than previous um, people who took the exam because of the online format. So you already have extra time. I know you want more than that because you'll always want more than that, but you already have extra time. Where am I on this? Okay. So constants are given formulas. As far as memorizing these, what I would recommend is there's some of these you'll probably wind up memorizing as you go, uh, but honestly, make your own formula sheet. You've, you've been doing things in Alex, uh, you've been seeing what we do in lecture, so sit down, what calculations have you done? What calculations have we done? And make, make your own. Um, so the same way you would sit down and memorize a formula, make your own formula sheet. So that way you, you have your own ready to go. I kept a little list of things to make sure you guys do. Uh, do make sure you find it or obtain a calculator uh, because you guys will need some sort of device that will do that for you. Uh, and spend some time organizing your notes. That was my other thing. Uh, so I had a bunch of things on here with studying tips and advice. Um, so, so, so for study tips, my main thing is figure out what you don't know. This is the reason why I like things like the SI program or, uh, or PLTL is because they'll ask you questions. And a lot of times asking questions is how we find out what we know and what we don't know. Um, so I was, I was trying to explain this in one of my office hours because there's a there's a really interesting sweet spot when it comes to frustration. Because a lot of times when you put chemistry into your own words, you can get frustrated because maybe you're not sure exactly what the right word is or you're talking to a friend and your friend is like, are you really sure that that's the way that that's supposed to go? And there's frustration when that happens. A little bit of frustration though, 
in those two cases where either you're not sure that's exactly the right word or your friend is like, oh, are you really sure? That's a good frustration because that's looking for the level of detail to make sure that you know what you're talking about. Then there's higher levels of frustration where you're either not sure where to start or you're not sure what's going on and you're just looking around and going, I don't even know what's going on. Uh, that's a bad level of frustration. And I understand that there's a range in between those two states. So really that's also why we like SI or PLTL or also peer tutoring um, because um, peer tutoring, office hours, um, anything that will get you guys some help because so sometimes you do get frustrated and you need to be bailed out and that happens. Um, that's why there's lots of different resources to help you with that. The advice to take time to get organized. Uh, so I had, when I was an undergrad way back in the day, uh, I had a class that had open book, open note exams. Uh, and what was really interesting is, is that there would be questions on there and I would be like, oh, I didn't prepare super great for that question, but I know where that is. Uh, I know where that is in my notes. I know where that is in the chapter. Uh, and so I'm going to do that question last and I know where my stuff is. Um, so taking some time to get organized, you don't have to have a beautiful organizational system. And I know we've thrown a lot of things at you. You've got a book, you have Alex, you have lecture notes, there's pre-recorded lectures. There's a lot of information and there's also a lot of redundancy. So take some time to get organized really just means know where your stuff is. If you have an organizational system that only makes sense to you, that's fine. Uh, that is that is totally OK um, because you're the only one who has to access it. Um, but do do take some time, sometime probably Thursday or Friday and just block off like a half an hour and get yourself a nice snack and a glass of water or something and just sit down for a minute and look at what you've got. Uh, and are you going to do digital notes? Are you going to do physical notes? Are you going to have a combination? Figure, figure it out because it's going to be your system. The other thing with this notion of it being your system is after the exam. And I know nobody cares about after the exam right now. But after the exam, either Saturday afternoon, or maybe Sunday afternoon. Take a little bit of time and just assess your organizational skills. Assess your notes. How did how did that part go? Because there will always be ways that you can improve. And starting off with just, all right, I went into the open book, open note exam with a plan for my notes, how did that go? Was it smooth and beautiful and wonderful? Were there some kinks that I could work out? Uh, that's something that, again, is going to be 100% up to you. So after the exam, after you've gotten some lunch, uh, after you've had a little bit of time to, to relax, just think back. How did it go? It's an open book, open note exam. How was your organizational skills? How did that work? Okay, hey, things on this list, I think I've already answered. Uh, values of H and C, do we know on the test? Uh, that's going to be in that potentially useful information. Number of questions on the test is going to be about 30. Uh, we always aim for 30 questions. Sometimes it's 29, sometimes it's 31, but we always aim for 30. Uh, will the questions on the test be more similar to Alex questions or the textbook questions? More similar, likely more similar to textbook questions, um, but I wouldn't discount Alex either. Uh, so, but they, they're usually more similar to textbook questions. And the reason why I like both of these is realize your exam actually has five authors. So Dr. Abacone, Dr. Diekemann, Dr. Seibert, Dr. Hashami, and me, Dr. Taylor, all five of us 
will write questions for your exam. So the exam doesn't have one author. It doesn't have one person writing every single question. It has five people writing about six questions to make your total of 30, which means that we all speak slightly in slightly different ways. We all have slightly different emphasis on what we teach and what we like best. Uh, and some of that's going to be reflected uh, in the exam itself. So this is the other reason why I like having you guys having access to different things because that way you get to see different wording uh, as we go along and different things like that. Uh, so are textbook questions really that useful in preparing for exams? I'm just going to go with yes uh, on this one. Uh, also, uh, we were talking about this with the living learning community folks before we got started. Um, I haven't started writing my exam questions yet. Uh, really, I should have by now, but I haven't. And when I'm looking for inspiration, uh, I will take a look at the textbook questions because they're something that you have access to and that are good things for you to have looked at. And uh, when I run out of time and I need help, then I'm like, well, we should just reward students for doing the end of chapter questions that we recommended because those are, those are extra and they're not graded, um, but, we recommend that people do them. And so I, I should reward that extra effort. Um, and so, yes, they are useful for that. I'm gonna come back to this conversion of units. Uh, key concepts from chapter one, really the only thing from chapter one is sig figs. That's the only thing um, that's, that's in chapter one that you're gonna need on the exam is significant figures. That's the only thing. Um, so yeah, otherwise the exam is on chapters two and chapter three. Uh, some things on uh, conversion units uh, and uh, okay, so so first of all, let me actually address this part. I'm confused on all the equations uh, we need to memorize. So there's some pros and cons to what I'm about to show you. I'm going to show you anyway um, because which tab is it? Ah, there it is. Um, so this is your ebook in Alex. Um, and it is organized in a pretty decent way. And at the end of every chapter, there's actually something that says key equations. So your textbook at the end of every single chapter goes ahead and says, hey, here's all the equations that we talked about. Now, what you might notice from this is, is that some of these are equations that we didn't actually do any problems with. They're questions that maybe we talked about the concept behind it. So for example, this equation 3.2, uh, which when we talked about electrostatic potential, um, we talked about the concept of this, but we never actually worked it uh, because it's nice as a concept but we don't actually do any calculations. So good news, bad news, your textbook has some extra ones. Uh, but if you're worried about what am I missing, your textbook has these lovely lists at the back of them. Um, it's also gonna have things like the Bohr equation in a couple of different flavors. Uh, some of these are just algebraic rearrangements uh, or combinations of, of other equations um, mushed together. But there are a variety of them. And again, as far as memorization goes, you don't have to memorize them. Things that I would recommend you at least have in a convenient location, in a convenient location, uh, are things like converting between wavelength and frequency, which is this one up here, uh, converting between frequency and, and energy. Those are very small equations that just have two variables and one constant. And so we typically assume that that's a calculation you can do very rapidly. Uh, converting between wavelength and frequency, converting between energy and frequency. So those are ones I would recommend that you have ready to go, uh, whether that's because you made yourself a, a formula sheet and you know where those formulas are on your formula sheet or because you have them memorized, that one's up to you. And I feel like there was something else I wanted to show off since I was in Alex. Um, I will actually go ahead and show off where uh, the questions and problems are. So a lot of times people will scroll uh, and they'll just kind of read through the chapter. For whatever reason, when you do that, you usually don't get to the questions and problems that are at the end of chapter. So when we're talking about the end of chapter problems. 
you often have to go to the table of contents in the ebook and then select them. Why that is, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is where those are at. Uh, so we, so these, and these are usually organized by the different uh, topics. At the very end, they usually have more questions that are then not organized by topic. So additional problems then are going to be a little bit more randomized. Uh, that's one more thing on your actual exam is your exam will be randomized. So there is a button in e-learning that we just click on it uh, and it will randomize all the questions in your exam for us. And we let it do that. Uh, so when you're looking at question one, realize that we didn't plan on what question one was. We let the system randomize that for us. That has pros and cons, but that's something that you should be aware of is happening. Uh, is we didn't pick it, that is just what the randomizer did. Okay. Um, it's a little bit, so we're trying to take questions at least every half an hour. I know we're a little bit before that. Uh, other questions on formatting things? Okay, so yes, we do have quite a few. Um, let's see here. Uh, Let's see, will the rest of our exams be online or will some of them be in person? So we are going to have the whole semester run exams the same way. Uh, so while I understand that the university uh, may do different things with de-densification, because we essentially train you in how to take an exam, we have just already made that decision and we're going to stick with it for the whole semester. Um, so un unless something drastic happens uh, that that plan does not work, um, the, the plan as of right now, which has been our plan since the beginning of August actually, um, is basically once, once we pick a method of your exam delivery, we're going to stick with that method because that way you don't have to figure out like, oh, well, now it's October, what are we doing this month? Nope, we train you, this is what our exams look like, this is how we're rolling them out, these are the rules, and we're gonna stick with those all semester long. It's a good question. Other things? Alrighty, um, let's see, stuff for technical. Um, I saw nuclear stability in chapter two homework questions, things like magic numbers. So we need to, do we know, do we need to know them for the exam? Uh, on the lectures, I do not think we have covered them yet. Yeah, so I have a list of things not on exam one. Um, and there, there is this part of your textbook that basically is like, hey, we talked about alpha particles. Let's go ahead and talk about radioactivity and nuclear stability. And we save both of those things for Gen Chem 2. Uh, so I understand you are correct that those are in fact in chapter two. Uh, and I get that, but those two tiny little topics are actually in 1312. We actually save those for a totally different semester. Um, some semesters we have actually like told you about page numbers. The, the really weird thing when you look at where that is in chapter two, it's not a separate section. Um, so it's not as easy as saying, hey, just ignore this. Um, it's part of section 2.2. Um, so this is the reason why we we kind of hand wave it a little bit is because some of this you need and then some of this you don't need. Uh, and so that's that's why it becomes a little bit awkward for us uh, to describe it. But thank you for pointing that out. because That was definitely on my list is, is that radioactivity, nuclear stability are things that we will not do this semester. All right. Um, and a lot of people are asking where the recommended textbook questions are like where they're located? So I will make sure those get flipped over into the 701 section because everyone's got a different organizational scheme. Um, so for my class, which I really want to go back and reorganize myself now, um, uh, but I believe I put mine in help with chemistry. Because um, I've got, yeah, because I have pre-registration for PLTL, which I should get rid of that link because that's done now. Uh, I've got a link to the Student Success Center. 
that is SI and peer tutoring. And then I have a folder that says homework from the end of chapter materials, uh, and that has recommended questions and then the answer keys for everything. Um, so that's where mine is, and I will make myself a note to flip that over to the 701 section. Alrighty. Um, what we need to know about the important scientists and their experiments. Yes, we spent time on that. Yes. All right. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> are there questions on the test that are not covered in lectures, pre-recorded video notes, or Alex and only taught in the textbook? Ah, that's a beautiful phrasing because that answer is no. Um, because there, there are definitely times where um, I know I did it in my 9 a.m. class where I didn't actually work a de Broglie wavelength question. I showed that, hey, here's a question and then here's the answer. And I didn't actually work the algebra. Um, so or, or there's been other times where I've said, all right, I'm just going to take questions over this particular topic. And so there are sometimes details that I missed in lecture, but those details were in the pre-recorded lectures. Um, so as long as we're talking about either live lectures and pre-recorded lectures combined, um, that's where the material is going to come from. So if it was if it's not in a live lecture and it's not in a pre-recorded lecture, then it's not on the exam. Um, Alex is also fair game. Typically, Alex supports the lecture material. There's a couple of interesting places where Alex does something with different wording. Um, but yeah, we we are not going to pick material out of a random figure legend that nobody talked about. Um, and the other thing, so this is actually the, uh, the benefit of five authors is that, and this happened less frequently because we get more and more on the same page as the years go by, um, but this is the benefit actually of five authors is every once in a while somebody says, hey, um, I told my students they didn't need that, or hey, I like barely emphasize that in class. We're taking that off of the exam. Um, again, happens less and less frequently as the as the years go by, uh, but that is one of the benefits of having five, five different people is, is that we have to all agree that something is fair to actually put on the exam. So yeah, no, no random figure legends in teeny tiny print. Nope. All right. Um, and then I think this is the last like technical question. Um, is the Rydberg equation on the exam or do we just need to know the Bohr equation? Just the Bohr. Just Bohr. Right. It's, the, it's actually it's under here. OK, cool. Other technical things. Right now. If more come up later, we can always circle back. I think that's everything in terms of like technical stuff. And of course, okay. yeah, if we get more, then we'll just answer them in the next. Cool. That sounds good. Um, so from some of the questions that people asked uh, in the uh, registration link. Um, so these are things people asked about but are not on the exam. So notice this says things not on exam one. Do, 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 not on exam one. Um, using the Rydberg energy constant. We will use Bohr. We will use Bohr, um, but not Rydberg. Uh, so they're they're very, very similar to each other. I know Rydberg was in Alex. Rydberg is in Alex to give you practice with that style of calculation because uh, we will use Bohr. Uh, then I had people that I do. I think uh, it's uh, just where the where the material ends this year is a little bit different. Uh, people were asking about ionic and covalent bonds. Uh, uh, so this is one of the interesting things about how we teach chemistry. Here we teach it in an atoms first context, which is why we're doing all subatomic particles. Uh, we haven't actually gotten to where you put multiple atoms together yet, so we will. Don't worry, but we, have, we haven't gotten to ionic and covalent bonds. Uh, electron configurations is actually chapter four. Uh, this is something that moved. Uh, so electron configurations used to be chapter three. Uh, it's actually now chapter four. So electron configurations is chapter four. It's coming soon. Uh, and electronegativity, atomic radii, and ionization energy, they're all coming up. Um, stoichiometry, there's two different versions, but usually when you say stoichiometry, you're usually talking about molecules. Um, or, or compounds, 
Uh, and you're also usually talking about chemical reactions, uh, which we also have not gotten to. Uh, so, so stoichiometry usually is talking about things like if I have one molecule of water, how many hydrogen atoms do I have in my molecule of water? Or if I have a chemical reaction, if I have this many products, how many reactants do I need to make those products? And we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so that's why I've got this lovely list of things not on exam one. Now, that being said, I know my personal plan, taking a look at the calendar, which I know <laughs> doesn't happen very often, uh, you might notice that here's where your exam is. Your exam is on the 18th. And technically, we're actually supposed to go ahead and start chapter four early, even though it's not on the first exam. Um, if I have time, I'm actually going to do that because electron configuration is a really beautiful visualization of quantum numbers. Uh, so the very beginning of chapter four is actually really useful for quantum numbers. So I understand that no one likes it when we do material that's not on the exam before the exam. But honestly, there's going to be some things that will make understanding quantum numbers be more visual than they currently are. And so um, I'm, I'm probably going to go ahead and move forward because visualizations with quantum numbers would be useful to your understanding. Uh, so these are other questions I'd grab. Uh, interesting and valid questions. Uh, will we only be able to ask to perform, oh, oh, this kind of question. Um, will we only be asked to perform calculations with wavelength, frequency, Planck's constant, et cetera, and create electron configurations for chapter three? So I like it when people ask questions of any type and any sort, uh, but I grabbed this question specifically to reiterate uh, the, the notion of five authors and I, I don't remember which section I said this in to my students, um, but I try really hard uh, to not underestimate um, my colleagues. Uh, so this is one of those kinds of questions where I'll always give you my best answer, um, but whenever there's words in here like only, um, I always get super nervous because there are certain topics that if I'm doing them, I can't think of a way to roll a calculation out of a particular topic. Like, that's not the way I would do it. Um, but but every once in a while, my colleagues do something, and I'm like, oh, that is fascinating. I never would have thought of that. Um, so again, I mostly grabbed that question to say I, I won't underestimate my colleagues. Um, the other thing I will go ahead and mention or remind you is, is that we did do uh, grams to mole conversions uh, and moles to atoms conversions. Uh, so we we did do some of those. And speaking of that, uh, I had people ask either about remembering conversions uh, or or how to do them or different tips and tricks. So I did want to talk about that just a little bit. So if we had a question. So for example, uh, if I said something like, um, how many moles are in, we'll just go with 25.1 grams of iron. And I'll put the chemical symbol there in parentheses. So, this is this is the question and maybe it just says so it says moles uh, and, and we will we were given three sig figs and we're going to assume the problem says to report the answer in three sig figs. With three sig figs. So there's a couple of things that I need to know um, because this though the wording in black is the only thing that the problem gives me. This is all I have to work with. So it's my job to know what information I need in order to do this. Uh, so I need to know that if I'm going to go from moles to grams, essentially my entire periodic table is written in grams to moles conversions. What do I mean by that? If I'm going to go ahead and grab the one that's from the exam, because I actually think I can get there faster than anything else. I'm usually better and I have but I knew I was going to do this like a lot. 
There it is. Um, so here's my periodic table. And this actually even has information in a key to tell you what a variety of things are on the periodic table. But what I care about is I care about one, finding iron, which is here in the middle. And it's got this number down below of this 55.85. So when I'm looking at my periodic table, I have iron and at the bottom, I have this 55.85. That number down at the bottom is in, is 55.85 grams per one mole. So it's my job to know that. It's my job to have that information. So then when we go ahead and do our conversion, then what I'm going to go ahead and do is I have grams and I don't want the grams. <laughs> the goal is to make the grams go away. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and take my 21, my 25.1 grams, and that's going to be on the top. I'm just going to put it over the number one. And since I have grams here, that means I want grams down here in the bottom. So I'm going to be dividing my grams away. So then I'm going to put my 55.85 grams down there and my one mole up here. Uh, so this is how I usually look at conversions, is I look at what am I given in the problem, because whatever I'm given is going to be the first thing um, that I start with. So I start with the given information. And then I'm going to do whatever it takes to usually get rid of the unit they gave me when I started um, and see where that leads me. And the nice thing is, is that that is going to lead me into being left with just moles, which is what I wanted. Zero point forty four nine moles. Now, I know some people were also curious about things like metric conversions or what other conversions could we do? And this is where you should have gotten a little bit of practice with at least some metric conversions in, in Alex. And as far as other conversions, this is the part where we as a teaching team have found all kinds of really weird conversions uh, that exist in the world. Uh, so sometimes we purposely will find conversions that you've never heard of before to see if you can take a something brand new and use it as a conversion. Um, I want to say one year when I was doing that uh, and it was my turn, I think I actually dug into like Harry Potter gold and was like, I'm totally going to use this. <sighs> I was really hoping when I updated my laptop that I wouldn't have this problem with OneNote anymore. Hold on. Uh, so every once in a while, this thing happens where my <laughs> where my answer is moving. Um, I'm going to see if I can swap over and swap back and see if that fixes it. That would be lovely. Oh, it did! Yay! So, uh, so yeah. So one one year, I think I used uh, galleons and sickles and newts and had and had people convert in between those. Um, Forgot what else we've done. I know that one was one of mine one year because I was like, what else have we not done? Something weird, something different. Um, so this notion that, sure, you've done grams to moles before, but the way that that works is by getting your units to cancel is a useful skill. Where do we want to go from here? I have, sorry, this is my giant Word document. Um, oh, someone asked about dimensional analysis with things like how hard would those questions be? Um, so th this is the kind of question that we assume you've seen before. Um, as far as if we were going to make something up um, and, and make you do it from scratch, um, we usually have a general idea that we don't want you to have to do more than like three changes in a question. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so I mean, it would be okay uh, for us to say give you centimeters and go to miles. Uh, so if I told you that 
we have something that is 1.23 times 10 to the positive seventh centimeters, uh, and then just convert this to miles. So this is where in your potentially useful information, you actually have some information about that. Um, so you have some options in how you do that conversion, but you have the ability to either go from centimeters to inches, inches to feet, and feet to miles, or you could go from centimeters to meters to miles. Um, all the conversions are there, but how you do that one is up to you. But we're usually pretty careful uh, in not having you say do this and also convert time. Uh, so this would be like a unit of length, but not going like from centimeters per second to miles per hour. We usually try to avoid that, not because you can't do it, but that's just more additional extra steps. Uh, so I'm going to use the 2.54 because it's one of my favorites. So again, I've got centimeters. I desperately want to get away from centimeters. So if I'm doing this problem, I'm probably going to find a 2.54 centimeters in an inch and get rid of that as soon as possible. Now I have inches and I still want miles and it's not what I have. So I'm going to see this next conversion and be like, cool, there's 12 inches in a foot. And then I'm going to look and say, I still don't have miles. That's unfortunate. I got inches though. And then now I can say there's five to 80 feet in a mile. And then I can go ahead and multiply by everything on the top, divide by everything on the bottom and solve that way. I'm laughing at myself. I'll show you why in just a minute. Uh, and I'm just going to keep reporting everything to three significant figures because uh, your exam is going to ask you for three significant figures over and over and over again. Uh, and you do need to report things to the correct number of significant figures because we are going to have uh, the computer grade as many things as possible. That's going to speed up how quickly you get your exam results back. So I understand having a computer grade things often sounds really terrible until you realize the payoff is you get your grade a lot faster. Um, so the reason why I was laughing, the reason why I was laughing um, is, I don't know how many of you guys have seen what I usually have in class, uh, but this is a TI-30XA. That just so happens to be the calculator I have with an arm's reach. And I think my other calculators have wound up in other back at work. Um, I'm at home right now. Oh, I have my other ones. There it is. Um, and even though you wouldn't think there's a huge difference in between these two, <laughs> how the exponent works on these are different from each other. Um, so even though they're both scientific calculators and they're both super, super similar to each other, um, me actually typing in 1.23 EE7 took took me a minute because they're, the buttons are in different places. Um, and I, I messed it up the first time. Um, so be friends with your calculator. Highly recommend. Be friends with your calculator. Um, so yeah, so, so things, things like this kind of question are fair game. There are a number of transitions involved, but it's all units of length. Uh, so we would consider this question to be not that bad. Um, as far as how hard they get, how difficult, it's always a good question. Uh, it's a little bit tricky for me to answer just because um, there are times where we're like, oh, but at least, you know, once once you're into feet and miles, I know they're not fun, but on the potentially useful information, all the conversions you need are right here, right in a row. So we would consider that question to be not awesome, but not that bad because everything you need to do is staring at you all on one line. Um, so we would consider that to be helpful uh, and, and that would all just be there for you. Uh, whereas some of the other ones where if we're going to do like length and time, then we're going to do things in much smaller pieces. 
um, because then doing length and time at the same time is a little bit more complicated. So then we don't do nearly so many things. And I know it's all a gray area as far as what is too much and what's not too much. Um, we will have those conversations all throughout the semester with what is too much and what is not too much. Because those things always modify a little bit as we go. Okay. So I also got a lot of questions about significant figures. So the main thing to, there's two things I want to tell you. Um, so one, most of the time, most um, of the time, we will ask. You'll actually see that on that little, what your exam might look like. Um, we will just ask for three sig figs. And that's going to be the vast majority of the problems. And when we do that, then you you don't just don't worry about it. Just don't don't overthink. Um, and and just round at the end. And just do it. Uh, the reason why I say that is because in our back end of e-learning, we have ways to tell e-learning, hey, give me a whole bunch of different numbers, make them up, have them go from this range to that range. Every once in a while, every once in a while, we tell e-learning to do something like, here's like 1.10 to like 9.90. And that's the range and e-learning randomly picks a number and sometimes e-learning will randomly choose something like, 2.2 and e-learning just gives us 2.2 even though we've done everything we could to tell e-learning to give you that last digit uh, so every once in a while this happens we try super hard to have it not happen um, but realize that if we asked you for three significant figures just just give us three significant figures even if there were only two in the problem i know that hurts your head i know that goes against everything else that we've taught you but basically, if you see that where we've asked you for three sig figs and you only see two, that's in that one actually is an e-learning error where we tried to tell e-learning, hey, give me three digits. And e-learning just went, nah, I'll be fine. And I, I, for the life of me, I don't entirely know how to fix that. Um, I've come up with a couple of things, but, but it still happens. Um, um, or we're actually asking you about sig figs. <laughs> so, so those, these are your two scenarios. Uh, either we just told you, hey, give me three sig figs. I don't care what happened. Just give me the three sig figs. Um, or we're, we're actually asking you like, this is this, this question is not about light or an experiment um, or atoms or moles or anything like that. This question is just about numbers and significant figures. And that's the only thing that's happening today uh, in that question. So those are your really your only two scenarios. In that case, uh, I did get questions that asked about things like uh, if you have multiple steps, what do you do? So let's take a quick look at one of those. So if I have something like uh, 99.8 plus uh, 2.1. I'm going to put that all in parentheses. And then we're going to go ahead and multiply that. Why not? Uh, times uh, I'm thinking, sorry, uh, 2.798. So I am going to go ahead and follow where parentheses go first. So that is following the old PEMDAS or parentheses, exponents, uh, PEMDAS, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Um, if you've never learned that before, that is something that we can talk about in office hours, or it's likely something that you did learn before, but you probably had some cute mnemonic for it. Uh, the one I was taught was, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, um, but there's a whole bunch of different ways to remember that. So likely you've seen it it's just 
you saw it back in like seventh or eighth grade. And it's, it's just been a while. It's just been a while. Um, so, but this is where we're going to take this one step at a time. So I'm going to do the parentheses first. So that's addition. So therefore I have to follow my rules for addition. Uh, so rules for addition are where what I care about in significant figures for addition is I care how many decimal places can I go? Uh, basically, how much information do I have around the decimal? Uh, and in this particular case, I've got one problem uh, that goes to the tenths place, um, and I've got the, my other number also goes to the tenths place, which means in my final answer, I get to keep everything to the tenths place. So my final answer is going to be 101.9. And I actually have four sig figs on this number. I know addition is weird. I know you don't like it. I know it makes you uncomfortable because it's addition and it has a different rule for multiplication and division. Um, so again, what I care about is I care about where I am past the decimal. Uh, if I had a different thing where I had a completely different problem and instead I had something like 99.892 and then I had something like still my 2.1, now I actually have the same setup where I still only know things this far away. Uh, so a lot of these are ones where they make a lot more sense in addition and subtraction. If you'll line up the numbers with the decimal place, it becomes more visual that way and it becomes a little bit easier to see what all is going on. Um, in this case, the main difference is, is that I would actually go ahead and hold on to more significant figures for rounding errors. Um, so if this was my setup, I would go ahead and underline where uh, that tenth place is and say, OK, that's where my significant figures actually are. So that's where I'm going to hold on to. Um, and that's that's what I need. Uh, but I'm going to hold on to these other two digits for rounding errors and for rounding issues. Um, this one up here, though, is what we were actually doing. So I'm going to continue with this one up here. Um, so and then I have 101.9 and all four of those digits are significant. So then when I go ahead and take this, and multiply it by 2.798. I just have two rounds of four significant figures. So my calculator spits out a whole bunch of numbers. It spits out 285.1162. I only want four significant figures. So I'm then going to, at the very end of my problem, round. And now it's five o'clock, so now we're also near that half an hour. How are we doing on questions? Let's see. So, um, we'll look for some specific questions. Could you go over the concepts of M, M sub L, M sub S, how they are related to N and L? and how they change the shape of orbital and the location of electron density. Yes. And then um, let's see here. Since we will be converting grams to moles and vice versa, do we need to know which elements are naturally diatomic? Uh, since we'll be converting from, so, so as far as naturally diatomic, not for this exam. Um, so you do not need to know which elements are diatomic for this exam because we are only going to have individual atoms. Uh, we won't actually get to things being diatomic for a little while yet. You will need that information this semester. So it's it's coming, it's coming, um, but not for this particular exam. For this particular exam, we're still dealing mostly with atoms and their subatomic particles. So we haven't quite gotten to like, when I say oxygen, how many atoms is that? Because at, at this point, we aren't we aren't actually connecting any atoms together. <laughs> so soon, soon, but not yet. All right, let's see. Um, do we have to know how to use the psi squared wave function for calculations, or do we just need to understand the concept? Just the concept. Um, so 
to the, the set of questions, which actually I did want to go ahead and move into quantum numbers because I know there's a lot of questions about experiments. Um, I know that there are. Um, but a lot of times, either what people are looking for is they want to hear the story again, which if that's the case, I hate to tell you, I'm the one who recorded most of those if they're the chapter two experiments. And um, I sound almost exactly the same. <laughs> so if there are specific questions, which some of you guys did give me specific questions um, about the experiments. Um, so, so the specific questions are super useful. Some of the ones where they were just like, oh gosh, I just kind of want to hear what I need to know about the experiments. Um, hate, hate to tell you, I if I do that in the review, I sound ex almost exactly like those pre-recorded videos. Um, I don't actually sound any different. So I actually did want to spend the next bit of time talking about quantum numbers, which will also cover psi squared. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start from the beginning with quantum numbers. Um, so I will wind up getting into uh, psi squared when we talk about L. Um, so I'm, I'm going to wrap that into that. Um, so quantum numbers, there are four of them. N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. So just talking about basics. The beautiful thing with N is N is the one that we actually spent more time talking about because this is the one that relates to energy. It also ends up relating to size. We call this the principal quantum number. Wow. Prim, prim, principal? Prim, principal. Uh, principal quantum number. And just like when we were doing the orbits for the Bohr model, all you do is you start at one uh, and you just go up from there. So you can have n equals one or n equals two or n equals three, and you just you just keep going to infinity. They're just counting numbers. And that's all. Um, so n for a quantum number is pretty straightforward. L is where the fun begins. L is where the fun begins. Um, so first of all, L is based on N. So L is based on N. So when N equals one, you only have one option for L, which is zero. When N equals two, you have two options for zero, for L, and they both exist. You have an L of zero and an L equals one. They both exist. So, and when you have an n equals three, you have an L of zero and an L equals one and an L equals two. I'm making a big deal out of that because a lot of times what we wind up doing is we usually just say something like n equals five and we're like, cool, L equals zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and we just go from, you basically just start at zero and then you end at n equals one. And there's a whole bunch of numbers in between and we just put commas in there. And a lot of times with those commas, everybody's like, cool, so there's commas. Are those options? Do they all exist? What's up with that? So those, those all exist. Uh, so when we talk about L, L is also called a subshell. N is referred to as the shell. So essentially what has happened is when you have a multi-electron system, so something else I saw some interesting questions about um, was people were asking about differences between hydrogen and not hydrogen. And the truth is that we often use hydrogen and not hydrogen because we're used to that with a periodic table. But the reality, whenever we're doing this and talking about any of these quantum issues is, is that the, the real question is actually either a one electron system or a multi electron system. 
And a lot of times you see hydrogen used because hydrogen is the most simple one electron system. But realize you could also use um, a helium. You could also use helium um, with only one electron. It would have a positive charge. So it wouldn't be neutral. But there are other ways to get a one electron system. Um, so just just be aware of that because I did. I saw some really well worded questions that really were just like, what's up with this hydrogen versus not hydrogen? And it's like, oh, first because it's a one electron system versus not a one electron system. So why we care about that is if it was a one electron system. And we were talking about this idea of n equals one, we would have an energy for that. And there is an L equals zero in here. And we would have an N equals two. And here's another energy. This is energy. Um, and in the N equals two shell, there's an L equals zero and an L equals one. They're in there. And there's an N equals three. And here's its energy, and there's an L equals zero, an L equals one, and my L equals two. One electron system, all of my subshells are degenerate. All the subshells in a shell have the same energy. We refer, we, we refer to this have the same energy as being degenerate. That does not mean that they spray paint on the sides of buildings. <laughs> it means that they just have the same energy. So that's a one electron system. In a multi electron system. This is where things get a little exciting. I still have this idea of energy. And I still have an N equals one. And that's an L equals zero. That's great. But now when I have an L equals two, I'm going to have an L equals zero, but I'm also going to have an L equals one. And those are going to be two different energies within my subshell. That is supposed to be a brace. That's a really terrible looking one. That's kind of better. And if I have my N equals three energy level, now I have still an L equals zero, but I also have an L equals one and I have an L equals two. So those subshells now have different energies. Subshells in a shell have different energies. In a multi electron system. So we usually say things like an L equals zero is less than an L equals one is less than an L equals two. But this is L. I should go and put L equals three. But this is L we're talking about. So we could also say S is less than P is less than D is less than F because an L equals zero is an S subshell. And an L equals one is a P subshell. And an L equals two is a D subshell. And an L equals three is an F subshell. I told you F got, oh, L got exciting, right? L gets exciting because L has an awful lot of stuff that it relates to. But wait, there's more. Not only can L have numbers and letters, L also has shapes. So an S is a sphere, and a P is that dumbbell shape, which I'm going to draw like this today. Uh, and D has either that clover leaf shape. Ugh. I'm sorry, that's terrible. Um, or the dumbbell looking thing with the donut. Uh, F exists. Um, shapes, um, I would say, but too complicated. 
if you're ever curious, they're actually really complication to complicated, whatever. Um, if you're ever curious, uh, they are really pretty. Um, so, Patron SPDF. Um, yes, the Sheffield Group, because they started fixing it. Sorry, I got super excited on Friday because this website used to all be broken and they fixed it. Um, so I know no one's excited about a sphere. So here's here's F. Um, so again, if you're if you're curious, you can surf, surf around the internet. Uh, the main the main thing with F, by the way, for us is honestly, actually, at this point, we're kind of still mentally trained to an exam that's all in black and white. So when exams always had to be in black and white, trying to display F orbitals in a way that was meaningful was next to impossible um, because these things just get really confusing really quickly. Um, now we could possibly actually do it, but we've, for, for, ha for habit sakes, we stick with orbitals that are a bit easier to understand uh, in a black and white two-dimensional world. Now, I also wanted to talk about, <gasps> sorry, I shouldn't get so excited, but I do, um, because, is it the dots? Sorry, one of these has something that's really beautiful. You can see electron density. Yes. Um, so someone asked about psi squared. So we don't need to know psi squared as an equation, but you should be okay with psi squared because it's the probability function. So here is the psi squared. Um, so what you have is down here at the bottom uh, should be where your nucleus is. And what you're looking at is the likelihood that the electron is there. So the higher your peak, the more likely your electron is present. Now, what I like about this is, is that this will actually show you, this is the graph in two dimensions, this is the graph in three dimensions, and when I hit play, you'll be able to see the shape that it makes because it makes a three-dimensional shape. Uh, but again, the middle part's the nucleus, and then we're looking at the probability that the electron is there. Uh, so essentially what you have is that psi squared function is what gives you the shape. So when we talk about values of L and we talk about an L of zero being an S subshell and an L of one being a P subshell, which is what this one is, psi, the psi squared function gives you your value, uh, relates to your value of L. Your psi squared function is what gives you the shape because uh, your value of L is going to determine your shape and your psi squared function, your probability density function is what's also then going to show you uh, what shape this looks like. So, oh, sorry, I find this both mesmerizing and just makes me very happy because otherwise you're always like, how do we get those shapes? Now what I am super curious about, because on Friday, I swear, I made this look a little bit different. Oh, yes. Sorry. Because last time I got it to work for the, the one with the donut around it. And it just makes me so very happy. OK, uh, so anyway, so psi squared relates to those. We could also go back to our nice, lovely 1s um, and go to that. And it's a little bit simpler. So there's our, there's our sphere. We're doing cross section of the sphere, which is an interesting choice. And now my drawings look even worse in comparison. That's okay. <laughs> That's the reason why I like to show off the real ones because that way you know what I was trying to draw and you also have a better idea of how bad my drawings really are. Um, pretty, pretty terrible, pretty terrible. Um, okay, so L, we talked about L being a subshell. We talked about L as a value. We talked about L as a letter. We talked about L as a shape. All right, on to M sub L. M sub L. So as a quantum number, as a quantum number, uh, M sub L is gonna go from negative L to zero to positive L. 
So when L equals zero, M sub L is just zero. Uh, yes, I do put slashes through my zeros. You don't have to. This is really helpful later on in my life when I'm drawing oxygen as this big circle and I have zeros. Um, so this just makes my life easier. It does not have to look like that in your notes. Uh, when L equals one, M sub L then is gonna be negative one and zero and positive one. Uh, if L is equal to two, M sub L is negative two and negative one and zero and positive one and positive two. M sub L gives you the orientation and it also gives you the number of orbitals. So the one I'm going to use as an example is L equals one. So we've already seen that shape uh, and when I drew it before I drew it in the, 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 the sideways version. Um, but now when I see M sub L, I see that there's three values. Well, this could be my M, my, my value that's in on the X axis. This could be my value that's on the Y axis. This could be my value that should be on the Z axis. So M sub L tells me about the orientation. So L said, hey, we have a dumbbell shape with two lobes. M sub L says, cool, Here's, here are your options for your orientations in space. So there's three different options for that orientation in space, and that's one version of what they look like. If I come back over here, this should show me a little bit prettier, um, my options. But again, same general idea with how they're oriented in space. I'm actually going to show something that is technically in chapter four, but sometimes at this point is helpful. So I do like to draw this about now because oftentimes it's about helpful as we're starting to see all of these different values come around. Not all of you, but a lot of you have likely seen this notation. 1s, 2s, 2p. So I'm going to draw. If you've seen this notation before, and even if you haven't, this actually relates back to quantum numbers. This value is my value of n. This is n equals 2. That's n equals 2. Uh, we've already spent some time talking about the fact that anytime you see an S, that's an L equals zero. And if I have a P, that that's an L equals one. We've also now mentioned the fact that if L equals zero, then M sub L is also zero. So the fact that I only have one line here is zero. M sub L is zero. M sub S, M sub, ah, L equals zero. M sub L also equals zero. Therefore, this is only one line. There's only one orbital. That's my M sub L equals zero. Here, my L equals one. My M sub L then should be negative one and zero and positive one. So here's a negative one and a zero and a positive one. So I have three values of M sub L. And I have three lines, which correspond to three orbitals. For those of you who have seen that kind of notation before, drawing it fresh since I've just scribbled all over it. Two, three. 
You've likely seen that the next thing that usually comes are these arrows, where an arrow is one electron. And there's two options for how you draw your electrons. You either draw it up or down. And that is where our last quantum number comes from. M sub s only has one option, or I'm sorry, only has two options, plus one half or minus one half. Uh, and that's it, that's all. Those values are equal and opposite to each other. Um, and we do refer to this as spin. Spin is a weird concept because it comes from a idea in an idea in classical mechanics, uh, which electrons don't really quite follow. Um, so it's as if this is not exactly what's happening um, because it's this this idea is based on if my electron was just a ball, and we know by now that electrons are not just particles; they're also waves. But it's essentially as if I had a ball and it was spinning as a point charge in either one direction or it was spinning in the other direction. Um, so that's how it acts um, and that's how it got its name is there's uh, is electrons have an effect and it looks like the electron is either spinning clockwise or spinning counterclockwise. But again, so that's a nice way to remember it. The tricky part is, is that electrons are also waves, so this explanation doesn't quite work. Um, but that is where the name came from. It's where, it's where we got the name from. So the other thing about M sub S is you may have noticed as we were going through that you have N that is a whole number, and L is based on N. And then we had M sub L, which is based on L. So they seem to all be based on each other. And then suddenly we get to M sub S and we're just like, oh, you only have two options. Plus one half, minus one half, and that's it. That's all, the end. Um, so so we, we, say, we save M sub S for last, for two reasons. One, because you only need M sub S to define an actual electron. Everything else we were doing was to talk about an orbital. Um, so basically, we kept, we kept getting more and more specific. So we kept saying, OK, so here's my shell. And then we're going to get more specific and say, here's my subshell. That's your value of L. And we're going to get more specific and say, here's my orbital. That's your value of M sub, that, M sub L. <laughs> oh. And then finally, we're going to say, oh, how's my electron in there? Uh, spin up or spin down? Uh, spin positive one half, spin negative one half. What's up with that? And so that's where you get your M sub S. Is M sub S is then just for the electron, but it only has two options. So suddenly that's not based on anything. Uh, and the only other thing that really goes with this uh, is the Pauli exclusion principle which always sounds really fancy. And I suppose in a lot of ways it is, uh, but all it states is, is that uh, no two electrons can have the same quantum numbers and have the same set of quantum numbers. And really all we're saying is, is that if we've talked about an electron and it has a set of quantum numbers, or we're talking about N, L, M sub L, and M sub S, that if I knew a lot of things about where my electron was, and I could say that it was in the N equals three shell, that it was in the L equals one subshell, that it was in the, um, M, the M sub L equals one orbital and it had a spin of plus one half. 
then there's only one electron with those sets of quantum numbers. The closest I could get is there should be one other electron, or there could, I should say, there could be one other electron in the same orbital, but that should then have an opposite spin. So I could describe two different electrons in the same orbital. using quantum numbers, um, but that M sub S still needs to be different in between them. I can't have an electron with the exact same quantum numbers. That spin cannot be the same. Uh, and this is something, by the way, that we observe uh, in, in real life. Uh, this actually also goes into the theory of quantum entanglement, which is essentially that electrons, and this is going to sound weird when I say it, um, but I don't remember the correct phrasing because it's just a strange idea. Electrons basically know or sense the other electrons spin. So if an electron got excited and moved into an orbital where there was already another electron there and they had the same spin, one of them would switch. So even if you had one electron hanging out, and another electron in an orbital by its lonesome, and a second electron joined it, you still would have opposite spin because one of them would change. And yes, that's a weird idea. Um, and this is part of the reason why electrons are weird. And no, I am not going to talk more about quantum entanglement than that. Um, quantum entanglement is really cool, but we, we're going to talk about other things instead. And hey, it's really close to 530. Um, I'm taking a sip of my drink. Questions? Alrighty, let me see what we got here. Let's see, do we need to know the graphs for test or do we need to know the graphs for the test with orbitals and all? The so as far as phase, knowing, but... so as far as knowing the graphs, um, here's, here's the thing. Um, the last one that I showed you, the fancy one, the one that I got excited about, um, I would say not this one because this, this one's about as weird as it could possibly be. Um, also requires something to be in three dimensions to actually make sense of it. Um, but you guys did an Alex topic. I know you did. Um, Alex absolutely had a topic where they gave you, here goes my drawing again, um, where they gave you a shape that looked kind of like this, except it was all filled in. And then they asked you about a probability. Uh, and then they basically would give you a list of probabilities and where different things were. And usually there was something that was like here on this axis, something that was here in this shape and likely something that was like way over here. And then it asked you to compare probabilities. Uh, and so what it was trying to do is basically here where it lines up with the nucleus should have been a zero probability because this is going through a node. Something in the shape could have been a high probability. Pro probability and something way out here should have just been a low probability. So I know you did an Alex topic like that. I also know you did an Alex topic where it would have asked you things and it gave you a graph and then it asked you either about energy levels or subshells. And I forget which one it did, but it would have looked something like this, uh, where here's one of them, and then here as a dotted line is another one. 
And then they probably had a third. I'm honestly not going to draw the third one <laughs> because it'll just make my graph even messier than it already is. Uh, and then it asked you to do something like tell me something about the energy level that these have um, and what's and what's going on. And these were also probabilities. Um, these, these were also trying to look at uh, the probability of where an electron was and trying to say that like, OK, here's your nucleus. And you should also remember that your principal quantum number in relates to size. So the farther away that you have a pretty, a relatively high probability, and I'm, it's, it's relative, right? It's not the highest peak, but it's a peak. Um, so here's a high probability. Can we just agree that the probability word? <laughs> Uh, so the, my dashed line has a high probability farther away from the nucleus than my solid line. So my dotted line should have a higher value of n. So because my dotted line has a peak of probability farther away from the nucleus than my solid line, this should be a higher value of n. So just because we cover something conceptually, this is a science course. We do think you guys can handle graphs. Um, they, they turn up in science an awful lot. Uh, and so we do think you guys can understand data in a graphical format as well as conceptually in words uh, as well as calculations. So yes, graphs are fair game. Uh, you guys should be able to analyze those and I know off the top of my head that you got exposure to them through Alex. So yes, yes, graphs are fair game. Alrighty, um, how do we calculate energy from a multi-electron system? How do we calculate the energy of a multi-electron system? I'm going to scroll back up real quick. Okay. So first of all, a reminder that you can do it for a one electron system. This thing, if we wanted to calculate the energy, uh, we would use Bohr, the Bohr equation. It still works. That's where those, those atomic emission lines came from. Still works great. If, if you wanted to calculate it for a multi-electron system, you use supercomputers. So we won't be doing that on your exam. Um, so in, 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 all, in all sincerity, there, there are labs that study multi-electron systems and the energy in between levels, and they do all of that. Uh, and they, they use supercomputers because the calculations are not pretty. Um, it's actually kind of mind boggling how complicated they get when you start to add more than one electron. Um, so yeah, you, you, will, you won't be doing it. It is possible in the world, like people do it, but people do it with computers, often supercomputers. So it can be done. Uh, you won't be doing it and not, not because you don't have the capacity, but because you need more technology. Alrighty, um, can you explain how we can or cannot see the electrons from the X, Y's, X, Y, and Z axis? how we can see or not see the electrons from the X, Y, or Z axis. I think this is one of those questions where if we could both point to something, that question would make sense to me, but I need, I need more. I'm not sure if we're talking about things like orbitals where here's, Here's my X and here's my Y and my Z is coming out at you and going into the board. Here's my X, here's my Y. Um, here's my X, here's my Y. And essentially all of these shapes are just likelihoods. 
that's all the shapes are. So whenever we're looking at these, these aren't necessarily a guarantee. All we really know is that we have some likelihood. So that's that again, that part where your size squared comes in because you have a high probability of an electron being in a certain location. Um, and these are these are bad graphs, but that's okay. Um, so in a particular plane, uh, so you have a high probability wherever the peak is high and a low probability wherever it's low. And then actually on the axis is where our nucleus would be there in the middle. And there's a node, a planar node that's running through this. Uh, so where there's no probability is where that node is. Um, so anytime we talk about where electrons are, the tricky thing is, is that it's not, we always draw pictures, but all of our pictures should be fuzzy in reality, because all we're really doing is saying, there's a likelihood that it's there, but I don't actually know where it is. Um, and so it might be just about anywhere. Uh, so if you think about it, where an electron is, like if I was gonna take a map of UTD and I was gonna try to guess where you were. Um, so we're just gonna pretend my map of UTD has three buildings, SLC. Um, we'll go ahead and put the student union. There's ping pong tables there. You might be there. Um, and over here, one of the residence halls. So those are, those are my three places. Now you, you could be in a lot of different places, but if I'm gonna guess, right, you're, you're gonna have a lot of probability density over here. And you're gonna have some over here, some classes are here, labs are here, and ping pong tables are over here. So if I'm gonna get a shape out of this, my shape is gonna look all kind of Woobly, um, but my shape's probably going to have some lobes, and my shape's probably going to look like that, where your residence hall has a big probability, SLC has some probability, student union has some probability, and so I have a weird looking shape that comes out of it like this, and I drew those as circles, but you're a person, right? So there's some possibility that you're actually over here. There's some possibility that you're over here. There's some possibility you're over here. There's parking lots and the library. And, you know, maybe you got lost and you're over in Johnson or the administrative building. But to make our lives easier and to make electrons make a little bit more sense, we just draw them as shapes um, that, that helps our brain a bit, even though we're making assumptions and we're eliminating information as we make those assumptions. Alrighty, we'll do two more questions and then we'll go ahead and move on to your uh, final portion of our review. Uh, let's see, how do you know which one is closer to the nucleus when it comes to the orbitals? So I'm going to see if this one goes back to this one. Um, so if it's if it's this graph, um, then you basically have an assumption that the nucleus is where that x and y uh, axis meet, and so your your nucleus is right there. And so closer to the nucleus is just wherever your peak is higher and closer to the y axis. So on on this graph, closer to the y axis is closer to the nucleus. Uh, closer to y-axis, closer to nucleus. Now that being said, if we wanted to relate these to some of those weird shapes we were looking at, realize that when we're drawing the shapes, when we're thinking about the shapes, here's my nucleus, and I have, we talked about that idea of uh, an n equals one, l equals zero. So that should be an S, which is a sphere. It should be centered on the nucleus. 
So any S orbitals are just centered on the nucleus. Pretend that that's a sphere. That's a little lopsided, but pretend. Then I could have an N equals one, L e N equals two, pardon me. We're going to go up in the world. N equals two, L equals zero. Also an S, but it's an N equals two. So it should be bigger. It's still centered on the nucleus. It's still centered on the nucleus, but it's bigger. So there's my, there's my N equals two, L equals zero. But with N equals two, we also know that L equals one, and that that's P, and we also know that that has multiple orientations. So if I'm gonna draw those, they're also centered on the nucleus, and there's three of them, and they look kind of like this. Here's Y, here's my PX, and here's my PZ. Yeah, something like that. So each one of our shapes or any of the orbitals that we've drawn should be centered on the nucleus. Uh, orbitals are centered on the nucleus. Um, and when we draw them all like that, pretty soon it's really hard to figure out what was going on in the first place. Um, but ho hopefully that helps a little bit with how far away are they. They'll also, the other, the other odd thing that you may have noticed is, is that when we did, here's my nucleus, here's n equals one, supposed to be a sphere, and n equals two, also supposed to be a sphere. There's probability that it's entirely possible, even though the n equals two shell is bigger and farther away from the nucleus, then n equals one, those probabilities overlap. So it's possible that in any particular instance that an electron in the n equals two S subshell is actually closer to the nucleus than the n equals one S subshell. Again, there's overlap in those probabilities. I think even when I, no, sorry. Let's see if I can get that to stop. Um, I'm still doing it. Um, so even when I drew this graph over here, there's overlap in those probabilities. And because electrons are going to be in motion, there's no particular guarantee of exactly where they are at any particular time. All righty, let's see. Last question before we let you go ahead and do your last portion of the review is going to be, can you go over radial and planar nodes and how they affect the orbital shape? Sure. Uh, so first of all, I avoided talking about nodes because we don't usually ask about them on the exams, but uh, they are usually helpful for figuring out what is going on. Um, so I'm going to do planar nodes first. So first of all, a planar node is a plane. So two dimensions, sheet of paper, but extends out infinitely um, where there is, there is zero probability of electron density. Zero. Um, so we drew an S orbital. There's my sphere. When we're going to a P orbital, essentially what's really happening is there is a planar node in a P orbital. Gosh, that's not a straight line. Um, sorry, I wanted to bisect it roughly in half. That's close to in half. Um, so what you wind up with in a P orbital is you have electron density on the top of a planar node and electron density on the bottom of a planar node. When we're looking at these, that's part of the other reason why I like these diagrams is I know a lot of times when we're drawing these shapes, we draw them like a figure eight because it's easier, right? Pen and paper, you draw what you gotta draw and that's a figure eight. But in reality, these, um, why did you go away? Don't abandon me. Um, 
Um, oh, Orbitron. Um, but in, in reality, they really are much more kind of squat because there's it's it's a sphere that just is missing electron density where those planar nodes are. I guess that way, when they go away, you can see the lovely grayed out planar node. Thank you, Orbitron. You're helping me make my my argument. Uh, so this this gray shape here would be your planar node. Um, is is what you would have. As far as radial nodes, now. So here's here's the truth. Uh, so I went ahead and I cheated, right? And I said, all right, there's a sphere. I cut my sphere in half. Hey, look, there's a p orbital. The truth is, is is that all p orbitals in n equals two have one node. That's the truth. Well, we already know in n equals two, I should have two different shapes, right? L equals zero and L equals one. I just did L equals one. We talked about that. In L equals zero, there's a spherical node. So there's a spherical node in an n equals two, L equals zero. There is a node, but it's, it's a sphere. And so there's actually a place inside of the sphere where there's no electron density. None. Zero. That's also part of why, I don't know if you watched when I was playing on Orbitron, but I kept just using these outside ones. And that's why, because that way we see the shapes that we are familiar with. And I didn't go any deeper because it didn't have to. Um, because if I do something and I go from 2p to 3p, weird things start to happen because there's different shapes of nodes. But anytime you hear the word node, no matter what it is, um, anytime we are talking about nodes, what we're talking about is we're talking about a place where there is uh, no probability of electron density. And what that then means, and usually where this comes around, is we talked a little bit before about psi squared and the fact that psi squared was our probability density function. Uh, and <laughs> sorry, these are not the best pictures. Um, and that my node then for this one would be where that y-axis is. Um, but these come from, if I was looking just at psi, this would actually be where my function crosses the axis. That is so not even. Sorry, I gotta take one more stab at that. Um, up crosses the x-axis, that's better. Um, so the node, the node would be where the graph crosses the axis. So I've got a limited amount of time left. So there was one other thing that I actually meant to cover in the beginning, but now is a really good time for it. Somebody asked, and it's a really valid question, uh, and I liked it a lot, which is why I wrote it down and then I got distracted, which sometimes happens to me. Um, they wanted to know essentially how close the review would be to the exam. There, that's what I wanted. I wanted this question. Um, will the review be really similar to the exam? Um, so I know that that's probably a question you probably wanted in the beginning, but now is a better time to answer it because I do my best during a review. Um, but I know you guys can't see all of these all at once, um, but I've got about two pages worth of questions. And some of these we talked about and a lot of these we didn't talk about. 
We didn't talk about isotopes. Uh, we didn't talk about anything about involved quantized. Um, I haven't said the word photon until right now. Um, so there's a lot of things that we didn't have time to talk about and didn't have time to talk about in detail. Uh, so this is always a good question. And the bottom line is, is that uh, I can't cover everything in two hours. Um, I can't cover it all uh, in two hours. It just, it just doesn't quite work. Uh, the other thing, so thinking about things that are missing, um, I think I remembered to call in the principal quantum number, and then I totally spaced out on giving the other quantum numbers their names. Um, so over in your notes, uh, L is also known as the angular momentum quantum number. That's its other name. Um, but I forgot to say angular momentum quantum number for L, and I forgot to say magnetic quantum number for M sub L. Uh, I covered a lot of this, but there's still things I left out. So I, I did my best to give a good overview. I did my best to give you guys stuff that makes sense in context to give you some pointers, but there's usually still something that as I'm talking off the top of my head and trying to tell you a story that makes sense and trying to make some connections that are useful to you, there's still things I've left out. Um, I left out, we did spin, and I didn't talk about the stern gerlach experiment, is what, which was how they discovered what spin was. I didn't talk about that. Uh, so there's always things that are missing out of a review, um, which I know is not what you want to hear, but it frankly is just the reality that when we're covering so much material and we've been in class now for three weeks. I know week one didn't go really quickly and thank you all for being with us for week one as we all worked with technology. Um, we all need gold stars and some candy for getting through that um, and as we will continue to get through that because I'm I'm certain that other things will still happen with technology as the semester progresses because it's technology and that happens. Um, but I just, I can't, I can't force it all in two hours. It doesn't work. Uh, there was something else. <sighs> so which experiments do you know for the, for the test? Um, so realize that there's a couple main ones that come out of chapter two, but there's still a lot that come out of chapter three. The, the interesting thing is, is that in chapter two, we walked through them in a very stately manner. And we were like, okay, cool. So there's Dalton's postulates because that at least gets us going on some chemistry stuff. Uh, and then there's uh, Thompson's cathode ray. And there's Millikan's oil drop. And there's Rutherford's gold foil. Uh, and we don't actually cover the experiment because it's not an experiment so much as it is a really long list of things that it wasn't. Uh, and Chadwick trips over the neutron. He doesn't trip over it. Uh, and Chadwick discovers the neutron um, really by talking to a lot of people all around the world. Um, and that's chapter two. And those are really nice, beautiful experiments that were done to show what's going on. Chapter three comes along and they're not nearly so pretty anymore because you have odd things happening, like the fact that you have the photoelectric effect. Um, so there's the photoelectric effect. This is something that was discovered by somebody whose name I have forgotten. Um, then it was explained by Einstein, um, but which I don't, can I spell this today? Okay, uh, explained by Einstein, but using uh, that notion of quantization uh, and, and, and quantized uh, from Planck. So these, all the chapter three experiments get a lot more muddy 
in in their telling because the photoelectric effect was not discovered by Einstein. It was explained because they already knew the photoelectric effect was a thing. They just didn't understand why it worked. There's a lot of things they knew about it. Um, Einstein just gets the credit because he's the one that was like, oh, that's why this works. Hey guys, I got this. I figured it out, man. Check this out. That's what Einstein did. Um, but the actual like setup and how it all works done by somebody else. Um, and so, and, and then there's other things in chapter three that are important conceptually, but aren't experiments at all. So you have things that we can talk about, like discussing the Bohr model versus the Schrodinger model. Uh, and again, neither one of those are experiments. They're, they're models to describe what we know about the atom, um, but neither one of those are experiments. Um, so, so, the, so chapter three gets really muddy in what you call an experiment and what you don't call an experiment because the concepts of what we currently know about atoms gets rolled together uh, really intimately with what we knew at the time. Uh, so a lot of times when people say the experiments, they're usually talking about chapter two because those are the ones that have really nice, pretty beginnings and endings to their experiments uh, and have people associated with them and a subatomic particle with pertinent information at the end. Uh, chapter three does actually have similar pieces but we usually start to lose the timeline a little bit and we start to lose where one begins and ends because a lot of this is amassing a lot of information to go into one total atom model, which again is a better way for the way the world really works because you've got bunches of different experiments all coming together to be like, oh, that's what's happening. Um, so I'm just gonna put and more. Uh, final round of questions, or are we just going to save them for later? Um, I guess we could do these la a couple, few little questions. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'll just do the ones that are kind of like yes, no, so we don't, you know, so that we don't go cool. over. Um, have we finished learning all of the chapter three material in class or is there any more left? Uh, that depends on your instructor because uh, I'm not done yet because I haven't talked about M sub S in my classes and oh, that was part of also why I had grabbed the textbook um, because I, I looked this up before we started and of course now I have forgotten. Um, but I thought there was something in, yeah. Um, so I just have to go finish M sub S and make sure that we're good on some energy of orbitals. Uh, and there's one other thing for my class because I there's there's one piece of nomenclature that I always think is in chapter four, but I think it's actually in chapter two. And it's a little thing with the periodic table. Uh, so I have I have a little bit of mopping up to do. Um, but uh, chap chapter three ends with with quantum numbers and, and atomic orbitals. So you should be pretty close to the end. I'm almost done. Uh, that's why I mentioned I was probably going to go ahead and go into chapter four because we get to some really nice visualizations of um, quantum numbers. That's actually, I went ahead and did it because it's a beautiful visualization, but this stuff, uh, 1S, 2s, 2p, and the, the little arrows. Um, this actually leads into electron configuration, and this is actually orbital notation for electron configuration. Uh, and this is actually in chapter four. It just explains quantum numbers really nicely. Um, so I, I like it a lot for quantum numbers, but it's technically in chapter four now. All right. Um, Will there be any free response questions on the test or is it multiple choice or a combination? So you can take a look at the um, at the, 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 the what did I call this? What an online exam might look like. 
Um, this is missing uh, a couple of options for types of questions, but it has our favorites. It has by far our favorites. Uh, it has select all that apply. It has multiple choice. It has matching and it has calculation questions where you input the number. Uh, those are by far our favorites. <coughs> not the only ones we can use, but those are our favorites. Um, I understand that I did not actually answer your question. Uh, and that is because we are not going to give you an essay question. Uh, so we are not going to have a question that just says um, compare and contrast the Bohr model from the uh, Schrodinger model uh, because you could write me like a 500 word essay on that and there are 1400 students in general chemistry this fall and I'm not going to read that many words in a week. Um, so there's certain kinds of questions that work and there are certain kinds of questions that don't work. We could feasibly ask you for something that was something you could answer in one to two words. If it's short, we can do it. Um, but you've got to write those questions just right because if you have to do it in a complete sentence, the odds are good we're not going to ask that because of how many people we would have to grade. Um, I did short answer for a biochemistry course and it usually took me about two to three hours to grade one short answer, a real short answer where they had to write sentences, uh, two, three hours to grade a short answer question for 150 people. So when you scale that up, it would take me 20 to 30 hours to grade a short answer question for the whole class. So, but again, do, do take a look at what an online exam might look like because those definitely have our favorite questions, our favorite questions. All right, and last question of our session is going to be, is the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty equation tested on the exam? Uh, is, is, Heisenberg, is Heisenberg tested on? Uh, so conceptually, yes. Calculation, no. Um, so the Heisenberg uncertainty principle really is the thing that broke the Bohr model. Um, so be, because Heisenberg basically showed that you can't know exactly where an electron is and you can't know exactly its momentum because of that wave property of electrons, that was really the thing that did in the Bohr model because the Bohr model was like, hey, these are in beautiful orbits, just like planets orbit the sun. And Heisenberg, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically said, no, they're really not because you can't, you can't know it well enough to put them in beautiful orbits like that. It won't work. So conceptually, yes, you can do the Heisenberg. Um, the actual mathematical equation, no. Um, some people just, for, for some people, sometimes an equation is helpful because then they can see how variables relate to one another. So occasionally we'll use an equation even though it's a conceptual topic. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is an example of that. Anything else or is that it? That is all I have. Okay, fantastic. Then I know we didn't cover everything, but we at least did a fair number of things, mostly chapter three. I'm gonna scroll back to just remind you all, my biggest recommendations are make sure you guys have a calculator um, that you like and that you know how to use uh, and spend some time getting yourself organized. Again, it's not gonna be perfect, but so don't don't spend like 10 hours on organizing, um, but just set aside like a half an hour to an hour. Get yourself organized, reward yourself with some lovely water, a snack, something good, and then plan to do the same thing after the exam. After the exam's all over, take a deep breath. What about your note system worked? What about your note system could use a little bit of tweaking? Because this is going to be a learning process. You're going to spend some time learning how to take an open book, open note exam. It's just going to be a little bit different. It just is. But good luck. You guys can do this.